our birth rates have actually dramatically declined. In fact, India is no longer producing enough babies to replace itself. I want to drill it into people's heads because there is this impression that we will be young forever. No, yeah. we have 25 years to do it. Whatever we want to do, this is it. Okay. So when I joined the government in 2017, you had a banking system that was essentially bust and the then finance minister, I mean, lately, called me in and said, since you are from this sector, please have a look at this. If you go to top universities today and you ask kids, what do you want to do? Yeah. That has changed. When I was there, they either wanted to go abroad or they wanted to write UPSC. Yeah. Now, you, you know, the brightest kids want to do a start. Yeah. This government has its ears open. We see the problems arise, we fix them. Then another set of problems arise, we keep fixing them. When I was born uh, in the early 70s, Kolkata was the most important economic hub in India. Yeah. It was one of the most important industrial hubs in Asia. Right in front of my eyes, um, it kind of fell apart. Kolkata didn't die. It was murdered and I'm a witness to that murder. Hi, this is Siddharth Aluwalia. Welcome to The Neon Show. Today, I have a super special guest with me. Today, we are going to discuss about economics, policy making in India. I welcome Sanjeev Sanyal, sir, to The Neon Show. So just to give you a background about him, uh, Sanjeev Sanyal is economic advisor to Prime Minister Modi. And he's part of the think tank that is setting up the, the policies for India on the economic front. Super excited to have you, sir, today. Ple very pleased to be here, Siddharth. Sir, before we dive into you know the policy making, the economics part of it, would like to dive into your childhood memories, right? A okay. couple of them that, that you think shaped you a later part in your career in government? So, well, I grew up in uh, 1980s Kolkata. Um, and I suppose uh, my strong distaste for uh, socialism and communism comes partly from the experience of watching how uh, Chief Minister Jyoti Basu and uh, the communists basically uh, destroyed uh, not just the economy of Kolkata and West Bengal, but, you know, the entire intellectual, cultural uh, sphere uh, to a point that uh, uh, Kolkata has no, never recovered from that shock. Um, and so when I was born uh, in the early 70s, Kolkata was the most important economic hub uh, in India. Yeah. It was one of the most important uh, industrial hubs in Asia. And uh, within my, right in front of my eyes, um, it kind of fell apart. And I always say that, you know, Kolkata didn't die. It was murdered and I'm a witness to that murder. So that happened and that had a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. And then when I was at university, uh, of course, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. And we, our own economy collapsed and we were forced to do the 1991 reforms. So, uh, you know, many of those experiences certainly had a big impact in the way I uh, view the world. And that's why you went to work for Deutsche Bank for a large period of your time? No, that had nothing to do with that. I mean, I, I didn't expect to be in policy making, yeah. uh, but I, you know, I went to work in financial markets. It happened to be that I ended up in Deutsche Bank after having worked in another place. But yeah. Good. And, and when government came knocking on your door to be a financial advisor, Right. How was your first reaction? Because that meant a complete change in lifestyle, but additional more responsibilities. To... So certainly, I mean, it's an opportunity to be a part of the India story at a major turning point in history. Um, I personally have a huge respect for Prime Minister Modi. So it's, of course, a privilege to be able to work with him directly in this way. So, um, you know, I was definitely happy. And yeah, sure, that you have to, you know, uh, there's a drop in your salary and all those kinds of things. But, you know, frankly, uh, this, is, you know, it's a it's an opportunity to be a, a, a part of history. Yeah. And that is priceless. And, uh, you know, uh, right now we are going to discuss a lot of technical terms like, you know, uh, GDP, recession. But would love to, if you could explain these terms to a 10-year-old kid, like in your own language. Well, we can explain it along the way because if I explain, you know, all of economics, I can't do it. But let's say the term GDP. Yeah. Well, GDP is basically a measure of the uh, value generation of an economy in a particular year. Yeah. It's not a stock, it's a flow. This is important. It's like the if you added up the incomes of the entire economy, uh, whether it's from salaries yeah. or from profit or from and so on, uh, it should add up to uh, GDP. So it's, it's the value generation of the economy as a whole. 
so not of any and then of course you you can take it from uh, any specific sector uh, the generation of power so when you are saying gdp grew by this much that means the full national income grew by so much that's basically what gdp means and and uh, what what do you mean by liberalization right that's a very important term that so of course about. it's a general term uh, uh, it's an english word uh, but specifically in in the indian context we tend to uh, talk about liberalization as the process of reform that started in 1991 in order to understand what that meant it meant that you have to understand what happened before that so basically between uh, uh, the early 50s when they when they just gained independence till 1991 India was a socialist economy which basically meant that um the government decided how much everybody earned how much they uh, who produced what uh, how much uh, and the, there was a huge dominance of uh, the state in all economic but also non economic activities as well because it's a it's a package and so uh, you had one at one point in time in the seven, uh, in the 70s income tax was as high as 98% uh, at, at at the uh, and you were at, a kid rate. kid back then and i was a kid at that time but it's also about you know uh, the, the the commanding heights of the economy are supposed to be the public sector uh, the bureaucrats had enormous powers they're still very powerful but basically they ran everything and wise men and of course in those days there were only men sitting in the planning commission told everybody what to do yeah now it turned out to be a disaster because our economy just couldn't grow it perpetuated poverty it you know it led to huge amount of corruption i mean it's not like all corruption goes gone today there may be all kinds of problem but people should go and read about the power of characters smugglers like haji mastan these were the real powerful people of the 1980s in mumbai a uh, financial capital so this was kind of the world that existed till 1991 now our own economy collapsed and then somewhat reluctantly we began to liberalize so, it so uh, just want to pause here right yeah. when you say economy cl- collapse what does it mean So basically, what happened is that our exchange rate began to fall apart. Uh, there was a spike in inflation. Uh, we had a huge recession. Uh, you know, uh, we were no longer able to keep our economic system going, and so we were forced to reform it. And uh, one of the ways, one of the first things that happened at that time, the Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and the then uh, Finance Minister Manmohan Singh um, then carried out a huge bunch of reforms. Uh, the the sort of central part of it was getting rid of what is called the license permit system by which basically the the government civil servants and of course by extension the pol- political class w- would decide give out licenses and permits so if you wanted to manufacture something or set up a some sort of a company or something you had to go to some government department and they would then look at it they would take put a stamp and then at every step it's not just at the beginning at every step you would have to go back so if you were a car manufacturer you would have to go to some department and they would tell you what technology okay. you use how much steel you are allowed to have how many tires you are supposed to have and for every tiny thing you would have to go back to this department and you can imagine this led to obvious risk, you know uh, rent seeking yeah. but it also made us extremely inefficient so uh, you know i if you have had the misfortune of driving around in a ambassador car you know what it felt like and and then the liberalization it mean you know we allowed foreign investors to invest in india well and- not just foreign investors but even domestic investors were allowed to do what they wished yeah. so you suddenly began to have a new class of entrepreneurs coming in and, uh, you know there was the boom in the it sector which wasn't there but new entrepreneurs as well so to understand what this license permit raj does it basically also froze our entrepreneurial class so we go and look at the big industrial houses of india in 1947 when we became independent yeah. and with the one exception of the ambanis it was the same people in 19 uh, in the early 90s yeah. because effectively once you had become big and you had the wherewithal of getting those licenses no new entrepreneur could come and there was certainly no concept of startups and all of this that we are not talking this simply didn't exist um you know if you were a, a young person uh your your ambition in life could be one of two things one is to leave the country yeah. the other is to sit for the upsc and become a bureaucrat so that now you could give out the licenses yeah. that was basically it you there was no question of having a uh, you know becoming a sportsman writer any other kind of profession basically meant that you had to be somehow beholden to that sarkari system 
and it's a strain that right i think the privatization of banks started in 1991 at that point in time right? well they allowed new, uh, new private banks. banks to come in but there were already existing banks but at, at the very least we stopped nationalizing them yeah. so new banks came or new banks everything airlines i mean of course many of those airlines went bust but it's okay yeah. but there was jet airways moody luft um, sahara all kinds of new entrepreneurship happened some company succeeded some failed that's all right that's part of the creative destruction of market based system but what stopped happening is this whole mindset that you know there will be a small group of people who will control the whole system and they will tell you what to do in exchange obviously for economic and political uh, you know power and 34 years later right or 35 years later you became part of that team that was reforming the banking system again tell us about it well i mean uh, what happened and why was it required okay so uh, to understand this you have to understand the sequence of uh, all the entire liberalization process so first of all what happened is that you had this burst of reform in 1991 to 93 but once those initial reforms happened and the benefits of that began to accrue and the economy stabilized uh they w- then after that the, they stopped doing reforms yeah. the reason for that was very simple we hadn't actually embraced reforms we had done reforms because we had been forced to do it and even though it was obvious even at that time that the, we were benefiting from these reforms the intellectual class the so called uh, economics gyanis of that time weren't sold on it yeah. so what happened is that once we did the reform bare minimum reforms needed to be done and the economy stabilized we stopped doing reforms yeah. So now other than one sort one or two things we did along the way basically we didn't do reforms so what happens is the momentum got lost yeah. so, and then of course the asian crisis also happened in 97 98 so although we weren't part of the asian crisis our economy also began to slow down and the momentum was lost and generally you know okay fine we had a good time but that was it luckily we got a new prime minister prime minister vajpai and he also then did a bunch of reforms uh, around about uh, 2000 2001 2003 that yeah. and that was the first time we began to create new infrastructure yeah. and all you know a seriously think about global infrastructure you talked about the global quadrilateral etc so then you got some momentum of growth generated out of that as well ironically the uh, prime minister who then came to power was uh, manmohan singh yeah. the guy who had actually done the original yes. set of reforms <laughs> but in his tenure he didn't do very much yeah. and so what happened you got the momentum from the vajpai reforms you got some years of very high growth yeah. and it also happened to be a particularly good time uh, for the world economy you know he had the goldilocks year so the combination of the two meant that there was a period in the last uh, vajpai years and into the next few years about 4 5 years of very solid growth but even that by 2006 was beginning to Uh, lose momentum and then in 2007 you had the global financial crisis and that that the problem was that our response to that was not to do more reforms but instead to keep this momentum going by somehow pumping up the banks so there was a period from 2006 up to about 12 so 5 6 years when in response to a slowing growth the authorities of that time basically opened up the banks and basically said you go and blindly lend everywhere and so some part of that uh, capacity creation investing etc was good yeah but then after a while because you had no restraint on the system there was a huge amount of misallocation yeah. so even though that process began to be somewhat tightened from 2013 or thereabouts the enough damage had been done that by t- 2013 14 15 you could clearly see that there was huge amount of nps building up on the banking system and certainly by the time i joined the government in 2017 this was you know one of the big issues in the government so of course this is where um you know i can uh, i can say it at a little bit more personal because i was a part of the of the story at that point uh, so when i joined the government in 2017 you had a banking system that was essentially bust and the then finance minister, uh, minister um, arun jetli ji Uh, so he called me in and said since you are from this sector please have a look at yeah. this so i looked at it and then there was a huge pile of nps as you all know you know uh, tens of thousands of crores for our listeners yeah. who are basic right huh. nps is the what is an npa npa is a non performing asset yeah. this is 
this is an asset this is a a, a, a debtor who has taken loan and is no longer able to repay it so he's gone bad it's a bad loan at this juncture and there's so much of it that's now threatening the stability of the banking system and not just the banking even the non banks had lots of this so now what do you do with this so there were many ideas so one of the ideas that was floating around then which was popular with uh, i think it if i'm not mistaken um the then chief economic advisor was also very keen on it mm-hmm. but others were as well um <clears throat> to create a bad bank what is a bad bank you take all these bad loans yeah. you stick them in there so that they don't infect the rest of the, and the rest of the banking system is then recapitalized and you get it going i personally thought that it was a bad idea the reason for that was that all you would do is first of all there would be no ownership of all the bad behavior by the the, the bankers before because now you can just wash off your hands secondly we actually have a history of creating bad banks we used to have an institution called bifr okay and bifr was a like a warehouse you sent all your bad loans there and then they would live there they would be festering there also there would be a factory that went bank or whatever all these assets would put yeah. be put there and they would fester there forever and ever and and on a, and government would keep pulling putting money in there to keep them half alive and this was you know a bad idea yeah. and now we would be doing it in a totally different scale so just imagine you know this is bifr pro max yeah so i thought this is a bad idea so i did a little bit of research and i found something quite interesting which was although there were a large number of bad loans something like 2/3 of it even more almost 70% of it was due to only 50 cases okay in fact 25 to 30% was only due to 12 cases which i named in fact yeah. the dirty dozen yeah <laughs> if you, those of you remember it. so i went back to yeah. jetly yeah. and said look why don't we take them through the insolvency in bankruptcy process now the argument against this was that the insolvency bankruptcy had the process had just been created so the sensible thing to do was to test it out with some small cases and do it but i argued and uh, i have to say at that time there was a banking secretary uh, mrs anjali duggal uh, he uh, she she really supported me on this and i want to mention her specifically because she she was a key part of the story and so was a uh, uh, deputy governor in the rbi uh, viral acharya yeah. uh, he and i disagreed on monetary policy bitterly but on cleaning up the banks we worked very closely so i want to mention them because sure. they are also a part of the story so <clears throat> the idea was that look the complicatedness of a case yeah. is uncorrelated to the size of the case yeah. so if you want to test the system why not test them with these 12 big yeah. cases the dirty dozen and they were not very complicated cases as it happened to be so you know if you want to test the system test it with uh, the big guys why with the small guys and so the insolvency po- uh, and bankruptcy process the first lot of cases they got were huge cases and they took them on and it turned out to be a very successful because they these the the ibc process uh, nclt crunched out these things these very large companies got sold off um yeah they had two benefits one is that the banks got some of their money back yeah. not all of it but quite a lot but more importantly these assets which were going to fester in bifr or bad bank or something ended up actually becoming productive assets and then eventually obviously they are also generating value and gdp and taxes and other things so what would have been a drain on the system became an asset to the system two the banks got some of their money back and very importantly the second order effect of that because suddenly creditor rights came back so there was an attitude before in generally in india ki once you got a loan it's the bank's problem yes. i may or may not repay it, that's okay. my problem that whole attitude changed and so as a result of this the insolvency and bankruptcy process is now very important now the, i'm not saying it's a perfect system there are lots of problems ancillary delays all kinds of things i'm not uh, i'm not making excuses for it but it did change the mood it definitely dramatically changed the the systems that were there and of course the whole attitude towards loan giving credit rights etc changed so that led to a cleaning up of banks which through 18 and 19 had changed our banking system enough that despite the shock of covid in 2020 and 2021 yeah. our banking system has continued to improve and today is in rude health the npas are down the liquidity is up they are well capitalized 
and they are all rudely profitable even the pr- public sector banks very often people yeah. you know uh, criticize them but they have actually done a rather good job of bringing themselves back and i think this happened all in the last 5 7 years when where there were a lot of bad cases like kingfisher was nirav modi was one then pnb yes bank right so well, th- there are many cases here some of them i want to distinguish here because many people confuse this see just because something is a bad bank doesn't mean there's just been a scam perfectly good business decisions may lead to some situation where somebody may go bankrupt yeah. or insolvent so i want to distinguish between business failure and scam yeah uh, unfortunately in india we still have this overhang and this comes from probably the socialist period yeah. that business failure you know some sort of a scam it's yeah. not the bulk of the cases that went wrong were just business failures okay. and do not confuse them if those entrepreneurs after having gone through the ncilt process come back and take new risks yeah. the banks should lend to them investors should back them because it's only a society that take risk repeatedly yeah. that is not to be confused by people who actually did scams that's a different thing yeah. altogether and they should be treated in a criminal way and that's a different issue yeah and and uh, when these assets got sold off right i assume they generated a lot of surplus cash for the government Not for banks? the government, for the banks. For the banks. Yes, the, not surplus. They they had written those yeah. off, and now uh, they are you know so they got some of that money back. So you know it add, they had since they had provisioned for them already. Yeah. So that meant that you know they had written them down. So now they are getting some money comes back. So in, instead of losing hundred rupees, they are losing eighty rupees, which is good. Now they can get on with it. I think and that improved the banking system by the example you mentioned when. this year right us silicon valley bank collapse few other banks collapse india was untouched when absolutely so this shows the strength of our system we you know like every country in the world uh, after the covid crisis was over we then began to increase interest rates back to more normal levels um and in europe in north america when this increasing of interest rates happened uh, as you yourself just mentioned you know it's dramatically stressed out their uh, banking systems and many banks went bust and still going bust in our case that has not happened our banks are in rude health they are you know in, in in and that is even true of the um, you know the non banking system now this is not to suggest that in future date something may not yeah. happen but this is uh, uh, you know um, an, an episode which showed that we were capable of cleaning it Uh, the reserve bank has uh, continued to uh, under uh, governor shaktikant das has continued to do a very good job of keeping track and 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 we are we are macroeconomic conservatives so as we expand this lending out we keep track of uh, we you know very very conservatively so in fact uh, you may have seen governor das making a comment recently about uh, you know excessive exuberance in the non banks uh, that's because you know we 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 don't want to go through this cleaning up uh, uh experience ever again it's like extracting teeth it's not it's not fun for the person whose tooth is being extracted but it's no fun for the dentist either it's a painful process for everybody involved absolutely and uh, tell us about uh the five most impactful economic reforms that you have been part of or you have seen closely since you came in government so i came into government in um uh in early 2017 yeah. i mentioned of course the bank clean up which yeah. was a very major uh, episode but a few months into uh, my uh, being in uh, government uh, in july uh, gst was introduced yes. i didn't have very much to do with actual introduction because yeah. i was very new in government so uh, the credit goes to everybody else yeah. but i did uh, witness uh, the introduction sure. uh, of that and then i was uh, you know part of some of the iterations that were done that to to get it going um then we were a uh, uh 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 then um you know there was a whole bunch of other reforms that happened during that period which i think are smaller reforms but they are very critical because i am a big believer in something called process reforms which is small nuts and bolts reforms which may inf- influence some small segment and the, you know may not make it to the yeah. f- front pages but these add up so, so in and, and and i can you know Uh, uh say that i was part of many of these reforms so for example uh we liberalized the drone sector we liberalized the space sector we liberalized the geospatial sector um we inter- and then there were all kinds of somewhat obscure reforms like the bilateral netting I, i'm sure almost nobody in the audience knows what this is yeah. but this is this is a financial sector reform 
that is very necessary in order to create uh, you know uh, certain kinds of corporate uh, debt market uh, uh, instruments so you know the the small steady doing of these small nuts and bolts process reforms has been a very important thing and some of these things are now beginning to be, uh, you know show up so for example one thing that i was very much involved in is dramatically expanding our patent system it's still ongoing yeah. it has not finished we are still doing it but you know in 2016 we were giving out only 9000 patents a year okay okay last year we gave out 35000 patents a year this year we will do about between 50 and 60000 patents a year in one and a half to two years time we will be doing a lakh patents a year so in less than one year we'll have gone from 9000 to over a lakh now we are, we want to be in the uh, you know knowledge economy yeah. you know we have to be serious about patenting yeah. now this is the sorts of nuts and bolts reforms a lot of these doesn't require grand uh, some grand change it requires going and hiring more examiners and controllers and smoothening the process in the patenting system let's say or we had another reform that uh, i was a part of uh, which is uh, getting rid of you know these uh, telecom regulations on the bpo ites sector yeah yeah uh in tech, in in legal parlance they are called other service providers okay. ospas and till 2020 there were these uh almost license permit raj type reforms uh, uh, license permit raj type uh, uh, requirements on okay. them uh, which uh, <clears throat> uh, you know they had to go to the telecom ministry and send for permits and ask and in fact technically work from home was actually illegal okay <laughs> from in, in 2020 how would he have managed covid if, if uh, yeah, that was exactly. illegal and it turned uh, i also it's quite fun to know how I actually discovered this is because of covid uh, okay you see when covid happened yeah the telecom ministry issued a notification saying that okay now all of you can work from home okay now i have worked in government long enough to realize that there's something extremely suspicious yeah. when a ministry says that you are now allowed to uh, work from home so i said i we were all allowed to work yeah, anyway yeah so i looked up that thing and then i realized that in fact the law said that you couldn't and in fact you had to, had to have an epa bx machine in your basement in order to uh, work from home what is what is that machine? exactly <laughs> what is an epa bx machine it's a 1980s 1990s okay. machine but you had to have one of them in your in your basement to work from home now obviously it was ridiculous yeah. but the very fact that the ministry issued this notification tells you that the bureaucrats were signaling that this law was still in place yeah it was yeah if, if somebody tells you that uh, you know you can now do it for the next 8 9 months that means what they are telling you that after the 9 months these laws yeah. apply and you don't know what laws apply no no exactly. those laws were there yeah. and uh, you know while individuals may not have been influenced but if you were a back office operator or a uh, back office uh, offshoring yeah. group or uh, doing ites it applied to you and you had to go to permissions and it was something like 70 80% of the time of a management time of some of these uh, back uh, bpo yeah. operators was used up uh, keeping track of these regulations so once i discovered that then of course i took it up with the authorities and you know once your your eyes have set to it we began to do those reforms and yes those reform the, the, you know liberal lip that got liberalized and subsequently in the years 2000 uh, 21 and 22 the, those sectors dramatically grew for two years because you had removed these uh, archaic archaic regulation yeah. now there are many such things yeah. that can need to be further done but i'm just pointing out to you none of these required great genius you don't need nobel laureate theories yeah. or something like that these are mostly you can see the blockage in the system it requires you to roll up your sleeves climb in figure out where in the system the blockage is and tweak those things till that flow happens i think i really appreciate the effort that the government brought in external experts like you to figure out that because you could see it with a fresh pair of eyes if anybody was i believe already 20 25 years and they asked them to clean up it's just like i am sitting in a in a dirty room right so i would not say it's a dirty room because i'm sitting in it then to be fair there are um, people inside the government uh, whether uh, there are you know uh, whether it's from uh, uh, political leaders yeah. uh, ministers yeah. in this government there are also uh, many talented civil servants 
and uh, you know i've had a lot of support from them from getting these reforms done so i will not <laughs> dis them so they they are also part of the in fact many of these things like this patent case uh, i got to know because actually a, a joint secretary who was in charge at that time uh, of the patent office actually brought it to my notice so many of these reforms got done because they were brought uh, uh, to my uh, to my notice or we made many of these changes with the help of many of them but it's also other people outside government also who have provided lots of inputs yeah. I mean, there are lawyers for example i have a, a school friend rahul mathan who has been a big help yeah. in trying giving me inputs on in how to make uh, the changes um and uh, you know of course there's the i had the guidance of both the prime minister and the finance minister uh, the commerce minister um the current uh, telecom and railways minister yeah. many of them give me a lot of support <laughs> and uh, and uh, ideas and uh, uh recommendations based on which yeah. these uh, these changes were made and let's say the the ease of doing business in india right is still uh, not among the top 100 nations according to global indexes what is required to make it among india among the top 5 places to for ease of doing business look it's an ongoing thing although i think uh, you're being unfair i think we would put ourselves uh, much yeah. m- much higher than outside the top 100 i would I think but anyway i mean all feedback is welcome and uh, you know we should uh, we should say that we should neither be too depressed yes. nor not nor uh, become uh, uh, too uh, triumphalist uh, we t- need to take a realistic view and there are many many things that we uh, uh, will take feedback on yes. so let's say if uh, if you had come 10 years ago and said doing business in india is difficult because of the following things one would have definitely been infrastructure yeah and you can see right in front of your eyes we are doing a massive roll out of absolutely so you know digital infrastructure in india is world class right now we physical UPI. infrastructure too yeah. i mean the you the airports you use yes. on our end will yes. very often be better than the ones you use yeah, in whichever agree. country you're flying yes. to e- even better than the us airports well yeah. us is a very low bar but yeah. uh, many other places yeah. as well yeah. um then you know many of the other physical infrastructure now we are beginning to slowly build out the urban infrastructure uh, um places like mumbai for example have massive construction going on um you know i apologize for the dust it creates yeah. but you know at some point it had to be built yeah. and it would be inconvenient whenever we built it but it's getting built so the physical infrastructure is getting done similarly uh, many of the old bureaucratic hassles are one by one removing i talked yeah. about you know opening up the drone sector space sector many of yeah. these other sectors i specifically talked about doing you know reforms in the osp sector uh the you know uh, right patents right now i'm trying to get rid of uh, mandatory uh, mediation in uh, commercial courts uh, uh, commercial cases so if you read my articles in the newspapers you will see many people are surprised that i am in the government and i i write these articles which are very critical of certain processes in the government but you know there is a culture here of taking a critical view of things and debating them and uh, you know we have been given the freedom in the prime minister's uh, economic council to take uh, up these issues uh, you know uh, my colleagues in the prime minister's economic council for example took on the statistical system yeah and argued that look we need to upgrade the system um so in a sense you can clearly see that uh, you know debate uh, and uh, discussion and uh, you know reforms are actively encouraged uh, and uh, right from the you know uh, apex um, body like the prime minister's yeah. economic council also you hear strong views on you know we need to uh, get fix this fix that and uh, you know we are encouraged to engage with the system so it, it's not just that you know uh, we want to rah rah about the economy so we fully appreciate the the feedback we are getting we ourselves give quite a lot of negative yeah. feedback and as a result of which this self reflection also you also have some reforms get done i'm yeah. not claiming that there aren't others to do i mean i i would argue that the direct tax system is way too complicated needs to be fixed and uh, you know at some point in, uh, we will get it done but do you think like uh, countries like dubai singapore because of their small size they are able to move very fast and able to create hubs so for you, financial activities so certainly there they have an advantage of being small yeah uh, we have some advantage of being big yeah um so i mean there is we can sometimes mimic some of their advantages yeah. uh by for example in the case of uh, gift city yeah. we are trying to mimic some of the benefits of being an offshore financial hub 
but then there are also benefits of being really big. I mean, we have a in large internal market when there is a massive shock, like say, for example, COVID. Yeah. Um, and you know the world begins to fall apart, and you know global supply chains break down. A place like uh, Singapore can very quickly unwind. Um, in our case, we can keep things running in, and we have resources and scale yeah. that uh, provide us a certain amount of strength. So there are advantages and disadvantages. But yes, I mean, if you are small and nimble. um it means that you can the political it, will it, can come into action really it, fast it, yeah it's a smaller system we can but you know to be fair we also have smaller units of government in india where you can uh, take decisions and get things done uh, i'll give you one example uh, municipal issues one big issue in india is municipal issues just cleaning the city yeah. up and you know you have a city like indore now more recently bhopal um it just got its act together and cleaned yeah. it up uh relatively small we have small states like goa uh, i would argue that goa has really got its act together and if, you, if those of you who visit goa i have been visiting it for last 30 years and let me say goa of today okay it's uh, uh, uh lost some part of its old charm yeah. but on balance it has dramatically improved from what it used to be as a, as a holiday destination it's cleaned up its act the old you know drugs and hippies uh, image has slowly got diluted out it's now a real high end high quality destination to go to yeah and by world standards by the way and i'm not just yeah. taking indian standards uh, and so you know we have smaller units and they do um, you know they they can uh, perform if there is political uh, will and uh, you know the business elite is also uh, has the will they can perform you mentioned one example right of yes. how india's population adds so if you have to summarize how does india being the largest nation by population helps it and deters it in economic growth so i mean having a very large population means also everything is large so the problems are also large but the opportunities are also yeah. large uh, we it creates a massive common market but you have to what have, does common market mean it common market means that you the internal demand the system yeah uh, uh, is very large so if you produce a product yeah uh, in say if you are in singapore yes there are some benefits but you know there is no large domestic market yeah. so you have to go out and sell it and you know sometimes the world may be in a nice globalizing environment yes. where you can easily spread yourself there may be other circumstances where you can't Now in India, the problem was till GST came in, we were not a common market. Yeah, it was actually more difficult for Mumbai to trade with Delhi than it was for Mumbai to trade with Shanghai. Okay, because if you just took a truck, yeah, across the country, it will stop at every state boundary, and different laws are yeah. there. Of course, there are lots of rent seeking and all of this. It was just a mess. Yeah. Now we have a unified system called GST. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's a dramatic improvement yeah. on whatever Agreed. existed before. Now. you can think of gst as a free trade agreement india signed with itself yeah now since you said population now you have 1.4 billion people to whom you can sell things yeah similarly they can participate that so both the demand side but also on the supply yeah. side you have you know you have um, you know a cluster of talent you don't need labor you can move them around the people can move around the country in ways you can't do with, you know all of those things and of course we are building infrastructure in scale so all of those things are possible because we are large now of course if that population is continuously growing at a very very high pace that complicates matters and that has been historically a problem yeah. but let me also say and many people don't realize this our birth rates have actually dramatically declined in fact india is no longer producing enough babies to replace itself it may okay. surprise people ah yes our fertility rate is now just slightly below replacement do you think we might taper up at 1.5 or 1.6 billion no a little much? bit more than 1.5 but uh, because we are very close to it yeah. but let me say that we are our population is no longer growing because of we have too many babies yeah. it is growing now purely because we are living longer yeah so <clears throat> that is a good reason yeah. for um, you know uh, population growth so as a result of this what we happening we are now in a sweet spot for about 25 years yeah. where there aren't too many children in the pipeline and we haven't aged that you know a large part of the population is old and beyond the working age yeah. so we have a bulk of population now in working age or will soon be entering the working age in the next decade or so 
so we are in a sweet spot we can deploy a large part of our population to produce things without having to spend energy on looking after children or looking after the aged yeah. and this is happening at a time when many countries in the world are rapidly aging yeah even china has now tipped over into the rapid aging phase so this is why you know when we when prime minister says amrit kal it's not just about the coincidence of the next 25 years being you know the 75th to the 100th year of independence yeah. it coincides as it happens to be with our demographic peak but we have to take advantage of it and also remember that it also will come to an end at the other side we too will age yeah okay it also means we need to do some things very very quickly and we need to understand the changes the dynamics of many things there are already states in india which have already begun to age like kerala or himachal shortly yeah. there we and we have to begin continuously change our mental dynamics for this so there are parts of the country where you need to actually shut down schools people don't realize this we may have too many schools there are not enough children in those villages and so on to participate in the schools so we have to so we cannot be emotional about these things yeah. we need to look at what is actually happening and in some parts of the country we actually have to uh, flip it and you know encourage births <laughs> because there are not enough children being or relocate more young people relocate yeah. to those places maybe those states have to take a view that they, they are happy to import more people yeah. or um, there are parts of the country for example in the hill states where entire villages have been emptied out we now need to actually find ways of populating people along the border areas to make sure that there is adequate populations living there other than just the military presence you need populations living there so there are all kinds of issues that happen as the demographics flips you mentioned briefly about right the amrit kal the next 25 years could be again where india becomes sone ki chidiya ah right what are the factors like the global factors so india is working hard the prime minister you are working hard the population is working hard we as entrepreneurs or investors are working hard. but what are the global factors like because timing has to coincide for a lot of things for that to happen like if we remember and recall you are a historian as well right so india became the trade route during the chandra so look we have historically been a very major part of the world uh, economy yeah. and it's not for nothing that the indian ocean is called the indian ocean yeah. it's named after a country is the only ocean in the world named after a country the reason for that is that you know indian merchants mariners etc were sailing all over the world uh, trading and we were the engine of world growth in fact uh, you know till about 1000 years ago one third of the world's economy was india then that number kept declining um, um through the centuries through the mughal period even though many people think of that as a golden period uh, let me say that even during that period our share of world economy yeah. was uh, declining in fact that china went past us at about 1500 and then it kept declining but even then we were very very large part of the world economy as till about 1820 and then it just drops off as the colonial experience yeah. you know deindustrializes india but interestingly it will shock people to know that our share of world gdp was around about 4% at independence but after independence also it kept declining okay so this is the thing that you know you have to understand how we let ourselves down in the first 50 years of independence for half a century our share of world gdp declined so by the time we were liberalizing our economy in the early 90s the share of world world gdp had dropped a little bit below 2% of gdp so at independence we are 4% down to little less than 2% at in when we begin to liberalize the economy then since then it has slowly been drifting up and we are actually now just a little bit above about 4 or 5% of gdp yeah. uh world gdp which is actually brings us back to where we were at independence yeah. that's all we have done in the last 30 years of growth we have just gone back to where we were and that that is also roughly true of uh our p- p- position in the world in per capita terms yeah. also we are just about where we were we are still a very poor country but in term as proportion of world uh incomes we have basically regained our place where we were at independence of course the rest of the world yeah. had gone far yeah. ahead we have begun to now catch up from here on we are actually now beginning getting into the zone where we are climbing the stairs so as you yourself pointed out we are now the world's fifth largest economy in 
dollar terms, US yeah. dollar terms, nominal. In purchasing power terms, which is if you adjust for the fact that different things are cost differently yeah. uh, in different parts of the world, we are already the world's third largest economy. Now, in dollar terms, we will go past Ger Germany in about 18 months to two years' time. In three to three and a half years' time, we will go past Japan. Then we will be, however you measure it, the world's third largest yeah. economy. This doesn't mean that everything has been solved. We will still be quite a poor country because we, ha we have the third largest economy, but we have the largest population. Yes. So once you divide one by the other, we are still a lot poorer than um, you know, Western countries. But much better than before. And even with and, and and even just having size has some benefits. For just the sheer size of the economy means that we can negotiate with the rest of the world in a yeah. very different way. Our place in the world is different. Our passports will become more powerful. Yes. Also, you know, the revenues the government yes. is raising goes up. So even if we are doing, you know, transfers to the very poor, let's say. Yeah. Our ability to do it goes up. Our ability to create infrastructure goes up. Uh, so all of this is being generated by that same growth engine that is uh, uh, expanding the economy. So we have to keep this going. No messing with this. Yeah. And without you know, doing what we did, you know, blow up our banks or do anything yeah. which uh, in any way interferes with macroeconomic stability. This is a compounding process. And those of you who know compounding, you, I'm sure you learned compound interest rates in class eight. Uh, the key thing, if you experiment with compounding, you will learn is that that compounding process really gathers pace over time. So it's really about maintaining that, you know, this year, for example, we will grow at about 7%. Yeah. Um, now that is the world's fastest growing growth rate. But in this one year, 7% doesn't matter. Now you do this 7% for a few more years, maybe the world economy will be slightly better off a yeah. few years from, we may even do 8%, maybe one year we'll get lucky and do 9%. But it's not about that any one year. Whether it's 7% or 9% is not the point. The point is, is it getting compounded? Every year, are we just doing it? And so do this over 25 years and you'll be surprised how dramatically the thing goes off. I mean, even China, we, everybody's saying, you know, it's now the world's second largest economy. It's now competing with the US and all that. All of this is about compounding. I think US is about $40 trillion. China is at... Mm, uh, so in uh, USD terms... Uh, um, nominal. Uh, the US is about $25 trillion yeah. economy. Uh, the China is somewhere about $18, $19 trillion economy. Not, so, not very far behind. Yeah, I mean, it's in the same scale. It's a little bit behind, but it's in the same scale. Uh, in PPTP terms, by the way, China is already bigger. So, uh, you know, China is a serious player, but it has got here, let me also clarify, through the same process of compounding. In 1990, they were just a little bit uh, larger than us as an economy. We have since 90, since the liberalization of the 90s, we have grown actually rather well. In fact, I would say for any large economy, probably second only to China yeah. itself. But China has grown by a few percentage points higher. And that compounding effect means that they are in a totally different place from us. So now that has just flipped, just now flipped La this year, last year, this year. We are now growing a few percentage points higher than them. That is all that is needed. Just compound this for a few years. And certainly if you do it for 25 years, it's a totally different thing. But even if you did it to the end of this decade, we, you know, we will be rapidly catching up. And, and China also follows a different version of socialism. Well, they firstly, their economy is totally not socialistic, yeah. except for the idea um, of political control at the very top. Yeah. So they have got a mixed bag, uh, and since uh, the, the the they began to really they began to do their economic reforms much before us. They started in 1978, and in the initial years when you had Deng Xiaoping and others, uh, this was done very much. Even though state control was used, uh, but there was a sense that you know economic efficiency, entrepreneurship, risk taking, etc., shouldn't be interfered with. In the last few years, there has been some change in the dynamics of it. And you may have seen that the, uh, the central government of China has gone back to being much more interventionist. Yeah. And that is, by the way, has, you can see the effect of that already. Yes. 
yeah, I mean, the, their growth has slowed down. Uh, they are having their own problems in their banks. Um, you know, some of their top uh, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, Jack Ma, for yeah. example, has simply disappeared from, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the, the front pages. So, you know, th the fact that in the last few years they've tried to go back some way in some way has already showed you the the price you have to pay for unnecessary unnecessary top down control and and i believe between 2010 to 2015 china was the place where indian businessmen were going for imports to learn manufacturing no yeah. look china is a serious player in the world economy even today we may have our uh, geopolitical frictions with them or whatever yeah. But we can't wish them away. Yeah. I mean, we still import large amounts of components from them. and Even you know, after the Make in India initiative? That yes, even with that, and will continue to be for a while. Of course, there are areas where they do obvious dumping, etc. So yeah. we will protect certain parts of our economy from, from dum dumping and unfair practices. But to say that we can wish away China is, uh, you know, we can't. We, you know, we, we may have our differences with them, but we will still trade with them, as indeed does the U U.S. I mean, U.S. has even bigger geopolitical yeah. concerns about China, and they still trade with them, and so does Japan. So it's not that we can wish them away. But yes, whatever we do, we have to do with our eyes open. And and what about, do you think, can India, in, in if you have ever, you know, uh, thought it, or given serious thought to it, that can India be a $20 trillion economy at some point in time in future? Look, the whole game is about compounding. Yeah. So, you know, you, you choose the growth rate we think we can do and compound it. So, in uh, if I'm not mistaken, if you take a PPP perspective of things, we are already a $12 uh, trillion economy. So, you know, it, it is the case that we can get there if exchange rates were more uh, PPP driven, then we would get there. But, um, you know, if you compound it over a period of time, yes, absolutely. It's, it's something we can aspire to, but, you know, it's not like it's, it's some God-given uh, certainty. Uh, it requires that over a period of an entire generation, we put in that effort. And because what I'm saying, that number, because at that number, imagine a $20 trillion economy with 2 billion population. Uh, First uh, of all, I don't think we'll ever have a two, okay. a 2 billion population. As I said, we are not producing enough children already yeah. to be able to sustain the current population. Uh, so while our population may go up yeah. a little bit long, uh, more because of longevity growth, uh, population will probably max out at 1.6 and then very rapidly then begin to decline. Uh, because, uh, you know, as I said, our birth rates are in fact uh, now no longer at uh, replacement rates. Yeah, yeah. But but the, the important thing that I'm trying to, to get to is the, the income of a common man by that time, you're just dividing the GDP by the population, will be like $10,000 in the USD. So time. I think we will reach uh, $10,000, but not with the population okay. uh, benefit. I, I keep coming back to this and I want to drill it into people's heads because there is this impression that we will be young forever. No, yeah. we have 25 years to do it. Whatever we want to do, this is it. Okay. After that, we too age. Okay, number one. And our population will not be growing. And at some point, it will be declining. Well before the, you know, somewhere in the in the in the 2050s and I, i'm hoping to be still around at that yeah. time um it will begin to decline so uh, don't count on population being uh, the bulwark of uh, prosperity into the future wow so that's why you are always coming back to that we have only 25 years to yes, do yes this demographic want. thing lasts 25 years make it during this time it is now what are we doing in 2023 and 2024 right now on the policy level, on implementation level, when there's almost a global recession triggered by printing money in the US, two wars at the first time in the history of the world after the World War II? That's not true. There have been many war, but, wars. And, but at this scale? since Yes, yes. There, You know, at, Vietnam War, this war, there have been but, many wars. But these are two wars going together. At well, the there were many wars, I can assure you. Yeah. If you go back and look at the 60s and 70s, there were many wars going on. And they have been since then too. And the war more recently in Afghanistan and Iraq was going on. So the world has always had wars. But yes, the, right now we have two wars. They are uh, certainly uh, unhappy things. And they affect oil prices and, and other things that uh, we depend on. And, and, and China is almost like a threat to us. And a neighboring nations like Sri Lanka has gone bust, like Pakistan has gone bust. Absolutely. So, you know, if we had followed those kinds of, uh, the kinds of policies our 
you know us academics were telling us yeah. to do we would have also been in sri lanka's yeah. position let me tell you this so thankfully we did not do that but right now what our game is look first of all things are going great here right now domestically okay and, and all, what do you mean by it let's say some anecdotes so for example if you look at the latest number that came out just now for the second quarter which yeah. is the july to september quarter um of the financial year it you can see that we grew by 7.6% year okay. on year that's a massive real growth um in nominal terms it's even higher and then you also had um you know the industrial sector in particular the construction sector is growing so these are solid numbers coming through and it is happening without any help from exports yes. because exports are actually mostly flat uh, they had grown in the previous year particularly services but now they are flat so without the benefit of a global environment that is expanding yeah. we are managing to hit for the full year we'll probably hit something like 7% that's a really solid growth rate easily makes us us the fastest growing yeah. economy in the world and very importantly we are doing this without stressing the macros of this economy so there is no spike in overall inflation yeah tom- tomato prices may go up and come down but there is no sustained inflation similarly our external accounts our current account our trade balance etc they are not blowing up in any yeah. which way uh, we have 600 billion dollars in foreign exchange reserves so we you know the the external sector is not under stress our banks as we have discussed before they are in decent shape so all, we are doing this 7% it's it's like we are jogging yeah. and doing this 7% ab we may now we may now get an opportunity at some point in the next few years where let's say the world is in a better place let's say there'll be cutting interest rates the world will be growing and so on in those circumstances we can do 8% plus growth rates but i wouldn't try to do it right now my most important thing right now is to make sure that we continue to build out the infrastructure we keep doing these reforms i mentioned all these small thousands of small reforms we need to do to make ourselves more efficient get our private sector and multinationals who want to move to india to yeah. build capacities and then wait for that boom period in the world economy then we will make hey meanwhile take advantage of the fact that we are a large domestic economy and build out that capacity and, and the last question is what what uh percentage of you know your time or at the entire economic advisory time goes into thinking about startups right that hey you some, are, some uh, part of our time yes i i just want to highlight that the the us it's was it is today uh, and what has role played the fa- the four largest companies in the us today are all startups of their generation apple google microsoft and amazon right so is india thinking of building uh, absolutely we are fully you know it has required us almost a generation since the 1991 reforms to create a culture which is risk taking innovation if you go to top universities today and you ask kids what do you want to do yeah. that has changed when i was there they either wanted to go abroad or they wanted to write upsc yeah. now you you know the brightest kids want to do a startup yeah. so there has been a major change in risk taking and when i say startups i don't mean only you know some guy doing some technology thing yeah. even somebody doing something like what you are doing yeah. is a startup yeah. somebody wants to go and take a risk in a completely different field want to be a sports person or wants to be a writer that's also a startup of a type so i am talking about the culture of risk taking and that has definitely come back in india i mean that the, there is a real energy that you can feel when you go out and meet young people uh, trying to do all kinds of things and i spend some time thinking about it um look some of the problems i need to solve are generic to everybody startups yeah. or not i mean improving the patenting system of the system uh, of uh, india is good for startups it's good for non startup yeah. uh, existing companies but there have specific problems for example you know lots of problems relating to taxation for example angel tax angel tax we try and keep fixing them i won't say they get fixed in yeah. one shot we'll keep doing it but what i want to say is uh, this government has its ears open we see the problems arise we fix them then another set of problems arrive we'll keep fixing them this will keep going on but what really matters is that we really want this innovation driven economy that sort of really drives india and it is in some ways this is what our real history is if you go back and look at a very long history india's economy has been a economy of startups and innovation we are the people who explored across the indian mm-hmm. ocean Uh, you know we sent merchants uh, exploring to um, you know the middle east we had 
them going all the way through the Southeast Asia, all the way through Japan and China and Korea. We have a long history of risk taking and exploration. Uh, um, and of course, we have intellectual risk taking in terms of mathematics and medicine and so on. So we are a culture which is naturally risk takers. We are open minded. Our, you know, Hinduism is very much about searching for yeah. the truth. It's not about telling you what the truth yeah. is. So this culture of risk taking is very much in our, in our blood. And finally, we, uh, after having let ourselves down for half a century after independence, yeah. sadly, finally, we have built back that culture. And, you know, that confidence that you're seeing uh, in India today comes from having built back that culture of risk taking. Thank you so much. Sir. I really enjoyed our conversation. And I'm keeping some part of our questions for a second conversation. I look forward to doing that. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank Hosting you. you.